Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, let me remind you that the open session of this council meeting is being webcast live, um, as uh, we now webcast all of our uh, council meetings, the open session. And in addition, we are creating a permanent video archive of these open sessions and making them available on the web, sort of as permanent historic um, material. And that includes both the video presentations as well as the various uh, documents that are associated with it, including uh, the presentations themselves. And in particular, for new council members, and I, I point this out especially to Amy and Jim, who are seeing this for the first time, um, and, but also for any web viewers um, who are watching our council proceedings for the first time, I want to make you aware of this electronic resource that we now have associated with my director's report sort of analogous to a supplemental uh, materials made available with a published paper. Um, and it could be accessed at this uh, convenient uh, URL listed at the bottom of the slide. And so the slides that I'm showing during my director's report are also made available at this site, either as a PDF file or as the actual native PowerPoint file. And for slides that are associated with specific documents or relevant websites, um, there's a document number shown on the bottom right of the slide, um, and that indicates uh, where, uh, where the reference materials for that slide can be accessed um, from this uh, table uh, shown um, on the slide here. And uh, in addition to the video archive I just mentioned, um, and, and all the web link, all these link documents, um, we will, uh, all this would be available for you to use or to point people to uh, forever as far as we're concerned because we're going to be archiving this. Okay, so that's the, that's the logistics associated with my direct report. Let me remind you what we are doing during the open session. Um, there are going to be multiple other presentations during the open session, and my director's report is tailored around these presentations so that I'll actually won't discuss in much detail areas that are going to be uh, discussed in greater detail by others. Um, Jeff Schloss is going to give uh, an update on DNA sequencing technologies uh, circa 2012. Um, Karen Rothenberg, um, who is um, uh, a special advisor to me on sabbatical uh, this year from University of Maryland Law School, will give a talk on uh, Genomics and Society, the LC Research Program, and beyond. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Mark Iyer was slated to give uh, a portfolio review. That will now be deferred until the May Council meeting. We also have a series of uh, concept clearances in addition to the talks. Um, uh, you'll be hearing concept clearances on the page renewal on Clinical Exploratory Sequencing Coordinating Center um, and Genomic Medicine Pilot Projects. In addition, um, a concept clearance on ClinAction, on Centers of Excellence and LC Research, and also high-throughput genomic analyses and children with newborn screening disorders. Um, this will likely not be the order. It's what, this is the list that's on the agenda. We will likely change the order um, for, for various reasons, but um, we will, it will become obvious when, when we get to those. Um, Finally, there's actually been multiple NHGRI-sponsored uh, meetings held since the last council meeting. Um, for example, a meeting on genomic literacy will be summarized in a presentation by Vince Bonham. And I'll actually be referring to some other meetings later in my director's report, and then there's yet additional meetings uh, that I won't say anything about um, because, uh, or very little about, because they'll be discussed within the context of the concept clearances. So for the rest of my uh, director's report, I will be covering uh, these seven areas, which are the seven areas I, I talk about each time. And I think there's a, it's a great framework um, for getting through all the things we want to update you about since our last council meeting, um, starting with general NHGRI updates. I would start off by telling you that the most substantive overarching thing to report about NHGRI is that we've moved forward in proposing changes to our organizational structure. And shown here is the website describing the details about both our proposed changes as well as the process we're following in proposing this reorganization. Uh, the latter involves holding public meetings to provide a forum for feedback about our proposed changes. And the second of two such public meetings will be held at 1 PM today as part of the open session of this council meeting. And so for that reason, I'm not going to discuss our proposed reorganization at this time. I'll defer it until my presentation at 1 o'clock. At this past fall's International Congress of Human Genetics, uh, American Society of Human Genetics joint meeting, NHGRI organized two very successful sessions. Uh, one was an invited session on emerging ethical issues in large-scale international genomics research collaborations that was moderated by NHGRI staff member Gene McEwen and former council member Pilar Rosario. Speakers came from various parts of the world to discuss both general issues and their unique perspectives. 
these issues are arising more and more frequently, especially for community resource projects that involve plans for broad data release and in situations where different cultural values and norms, as well as different legal and regulatory requirements, have to be reconciled. Uh, the second uh, session uh, in, that NHGRI was involved in organizing was a tutorial uh, on using 1,000 Genomes Project data. Uh, this gathering was attended by over 300 people, and importantly, we, there, we were there videotaping that session, and that, has now, that videotape has now been downloaded over 350 times from our website in a URL that you can access at document two. Among the many publications emanating from NHGRI since the last council meeting was an invited commentary published in Cell, in which Terry Manolio and myself co-authored a piece that describes some of the clinical implications of genomic advances. I bring this to your attention because Cell specifically asked us to write um, something about the near-term clinical applications of genomics that provided a bit more detail than what we had described in our strategic plan published last February in, um, in Nature, and this is the piece that uh, came about from that invitation. And on uh, the lighter side, but important, um, and those uh, who think that NHGRI staff members are only good at genomics, I will point out to you that longtime NHGRI or Betty Graham also has a long and distinguished career as a competitive fencer. In fact, Betty traveled to Croatia in October as a member of the USA Veteran Fencing Team to compete in the 2011 World Veterans Fencing Championship, and lo and behold, Betty came home with a bronze medal in her class. And if my... It, there, there is more. If my sources are correct, Betty is the current U.S. veteran national champion in both foil and epi, and the 2011 Veteran World Championships was the ninth World Championships at which she has represented the United States. So, it, 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 so my first thing is congratulations, Zorro. I mean, congratulations, Betty. And, it, it, and all appeals for grants now will go directly to Betty with a sword in her hand. Okay, that's what I want to tell you about NHGRI. Now, moving on to general NIH updates. Um, speaking of swashbuckling, uh, the most significant organizational news at, at NIH in recent months was the creation of a new NIH center, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS. Now, as part of the fiscal year 2012 Omnibus Appropriations Bill, the National Center for Research Resources, or NCRR, was dissolved and NCATS was established. And NCATS now has a budget this fiscal year of $575 million. <coughs> Additional details, the acting director of NCATS is Tom Insel, the director of NIMH, Mental Health Institute, and the acting deputy director of NCATS is Kathy Hudson, who is the NIH deputy director for science outreach and policy. Uh, note that the search for a permanent NCATS director is very active. I can tell you it's very active because I, along with Tom Insel, are the co-chairs of that search committee, and we are at a very uh, advanced stage at identifying candidates and, um, and helping Francis Collins identify the founding uh, director um, for this new center. Now, there are many components that are now housed within NCATS. Particularly notable ones include the Clinical and Translational Science Awards, the CTSA program, the Cures Acceleration Network, the newly created Division of Preclinical Innovation that's headed by Chris Austin. Now, I point out that the latter has mostly been formed from the National Center for Translational uh, Therapeutics, or NCTT, an entity that grew up and operated with NHGRI for almost a decade. And so with the creation of NCATS, about 100, or actually more than 100 NHGRI employees, uh, all under Chris Austin's leadership, uh, departed our institute in block as part of the creation of NCATS. And so this has had an important um, impact on our institute as well but it's very exciting to see this new center finally formed and now uh, getting operational. Now, in addition to the NCRR programs that went to NCATS, other components were assigned to other NIH, uh, either to the NIH Office of the Director or to one of five different institutes, and I list them there. And there's a fairly lengthy list of such NCRR elements um, and where they got relocated, and if you're interested in seeing that, um, that's available on a website that is uh, linked to document um, number five. Um, as I, uh, I've mentioned previously, um, and in very much uh, the a continued uh, area related to reorganization, the NIH Scientific Management and Review Board, SMRB, has recommended the merger of two NIH institutes involved in research related to addiction and substance use, specifically 
the National Institute on Drug Abuse, or NIDA, and the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, known as NIAAA. As we've come to learn, abolishing or merging or creating or even reorganizing NIH institutes or centers is a long and complex process. And so, indeed, last week, NIH issued a request for information, known as an RFI, seeking input into the scientific strategic plan for the proposed new merged institute, which has preliminarily been named the National Institute of Substance Use and Addiction Disorders. So if you have anything you want to provide about that, um, that input is due uh, at the site on document six by May 11th, which is why I want to bring it to your attention now. Also at the NIH level, there was a joint NIH industry workshop on the subject of target validation this past November. Now this gathering included high-level representatives for virtually all of the major pharmaceutical companies with the goal of exploring how to use, use various scientific opportunities, I will tell you with a particular emphasis on genomic advances, to improve the process of identifying suitable targets for drug development. The executive summary of that workshop is available as document seven. Well, not surprisingly, NHGRI has been asked to help with many of these areas, um, especially in the future. So for example, I am now serving on an overarching steering committee with uh, pharmaceutical representatives and other NIH representatives for all of the efforts that are being packaged under the, uh, under the general area of target validation. Terry Manolio of NHGRI will be co-leading an NIH industry academia working group to explore possible genomics-oriented projects that would move from genotype to phenotype or from phenotype to genotype in pursuit of identifying validating such targets. And I'll also tell you that NHGRI has been asked to organize two workshops that will be relevant to these efforts, one on the notion of aggregating genome sequence data in a fashion to accelerate genomic discoveries, and one on exploring the merits of using different types of cohorts in genome sequencing projects. Obviously, both of these workshops are very relevant to things we're interested in, but they'll also feed into the kinds of deliberations going on around some of the strategic planning and target validation, and so it will serve both purposes. Well, moving on, another critical area of NIH news relates to the budget situation. So for this, we try to find humor where we can, although there isn't very much funny about the current situation. But let me tell you where we are. Recall that when we last met, Congress was still debating the funding levels for federal agencies for fiscal year 2012, and that NHGRI's budget for the current fiscal year was unclear. As you no doubt now know, Congress was able to complete this uh, budgeting process just before the holidays with the passage of a megabus bill containing funding for most of the federal government. This means that we now know NHGRI's budget until the end of September of this year. Specifically, recall that the President had requested an increase of NHGRI's budget to, to $525 million um, in fiscal 2012, up from $511 million in fiscal year 2011. This was the figure in a bill introduced in the House, while a Senate bill passed by the Appropriations Committee had NHGRI getting a $5 million decrease in our budget. Well, when all the dust settled, we ended up somewhere in between. A very slight increase over fiscal year 2011, a total of $513 million, or an increase of just under 0.3%. So we essentially end up being flat with respect to last year, uh, sadly, flat becomes the new feel-good budget, uh, recalibrating your expectations such that you're happy to have dodged the bullet of a serious budget cut. But the next uncertainty uh, is the fiscal year 2013 budget, which will be proposed and debated with the backdrop of an election year. This is further complicated by the recent failure to reach a deal for deficit reduction. So recall the creation of the super committee um, as part of the Budget Control Act, a law that was passed last year to limit government spending over the next decade. And the charge to the super committee was by November 23rd, the past November 23rd, to identify ways to reduce the deficit by at least $1.2 trillion over the next decade. Well, the super committee uh, was not successful. Now, failure of the super committee triggers an automatic across the board $1.2 trillion cut to federal agencies in 2013. And in theory, this would amount to an 8 to 9 percent reduction to NHGRI's budget starting next January 2nd, but actually retroactive to October 1 of this year. And NIH's budget or NHGRI? Uh, both. All. Both. Actually, all federal, all, uh, uh, all non-military. Actually, maybe this across the board, but it's absolutely NIH. Well, while seemingly unthinkable, 
uh, we could not ignore developing what-if scenarios to deal with such a circumstance. But the overall fiscal year 2013 budgeting process must still march forward. So today is actually a significant day in that the president will actually deliver his fiscal year 2013 budget to Congress, which will include the proposed funding level for NIH and NHGRI. And in fact, stories have already come out over the weekend uh, in anticipation of what the president is going to announce today in releasing his budget. So that's actually all I can say about the president's fiscal year 13 budget for now. Um, uh, but later today, I can say more, and I will. Um, once the president has formally made his announcement, I'll be able to tell you what this, uh, that the president's budget is uh, for 2013. But recognize this is all taking place in the context of an election year under um, concerns about um, uh, the, the automatic sequestration, 8 to 9 percent. Uh, it is a very complicated circumstance that we are going to be living in over the next uh, year or so, or at least 11 months. Um, other news at the NIH level, in January of 2011, President Obama signed the National Alzheimer's Project Act, which calls for an aggressive and coordinated national Alzheimer's disease plan. As part of that plan, DHHS Secretary Sebelius announced last week that NIH would make available $50 million for Alzheimer's research in fiscal year 2012, and then $80 million in fiscal year 2013. This is additional money beyond what's already being spent on Alzheimer's. Now, these efforts will include genomic studies aiming to identify genes that increase risk for the disease, and it is very likely that NHGRI will be involved in this research. The details about how NHGRI will become involved are actively being worked out, and we will undoubtedly have more to report about this at the May Council meeting. Moving on to honors, a huge honor was bestowed upon NIH this past fall when the NIH Clinical Center was awarded the 2011 Lasker Bloomberg Public Service Award. Largely regarded as the crown jewel of the NIH intramural research program, the NIH Clinical Center was given this highly prestigious award for serving as a model institution that has transformed scientific advances into innovative therapies and has provided high quality care to, to numerous patients. In November, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Rodden Clinton visited NIH to deliver a major policy speech in which she called for a renewed push for an AIDS-free generation. The speech marked the 30th year in the fight against HIV AIDS and kicked off preparation for World AIDS Day activities and the International Conference AIDS 2012, which will be held in Washington, D.C. next June. Also at the NIH level, recognizing the pervasive bottleneck and challenges related to big data and informatics, an area obvious of particular interest to NHGRI, of interest to this council, and certainly of interest to the genomics community, Francis Collins established a new working group of his advisory committee to the director. This working group aims to investigate the management integration and analysis of large biomedical data sets, and it's called the NIH Data and Informatics Working Group. And then the group is co-chaired by David Demetz of the University of Wisconsin and Larry Tayback, NIH Deputy Director, and includes members such as Russ Altman, David Botstein, Don Masis, and actually includes Council Member Jill Mizoroff. Now, recommendations from this working group are due this summer, and meanwhile, NHGRI and NIGMS have been asked to co-lead a trans-NIH working group, an internal working group, to take the recommendations forward in the area of molecular data, specifically genomics data predominantly. And other NIH working groups will deal with other areas, such as phenotype data and imaging data that are also being considered. So this, um, advisory, this working group of the advisory committee, the director, will wind down by the summer and then there'll be an internal group that will pick up and move forward from those recommendations beyond that, and our institute and GMS will be co-leading uh, that internal group. Now, as part of their deliberations, the NIH Data and Informatics Working Group has issued a request for information, another one of these RFIs, to solicit input from the community on a broad series of topics relevant to this complex area. A subset of those topics is listed here, and, while and there's additional detailed subtopics that can be found in the RFI itself a link of which is available on document 12. And I bring this to your attention because the RFI will accept public comments through March 12th of 2012. Uh, March 12th uh, is an easy date for me to remember. It's when my son is going to turn 16 and my life will never be the same, but that's besides the point. But please share this link with your colleagues and any organizations that you feel are appropriate because the resulting information is obviously of great interest to us at NHGRI. And I really do think that having this working group get as much information as they can, all that information will be passed off to this new working group that we will be involved in. I think it will be very important uh, for us to have as much 
data and information in front of us as possible. Okay, so let me move on uh, from the NIH and now talk about uh, genomics um, uh, in particular and updates that have happened since last council meeting. Let's start um, with uh, sad news um, that the legendary geneticist James Crow died January 4th, 2012. Uh, he was 95 years old and was still actively working at the University of Wisconsin at the beginning of this academic year. Uh, James Crow was a leader in the field of population genetics who helped shape public policy about atomic radiation damage as well as the use of DNA in the courtroom. He was also a highly regarded genetics teacher. His Crow's Notes, as they were called, was a textbook widely used at the college level for introduction to genetics courses. I know Crow's Notes extremely well because I took Jim, James Crow's uh, Genetics 101 course in 1979. I will tell you, maybe I shouldn't admit this, it was by far the most substantive genetics coursework I'd taken in my entire life. It was, it was incredible. It was awesome. It was one of these things where, at, especially University of Wisconsin, you know, six, five, six hundred students would be in attendance. I would usually sit up in the balcony because you couldn't even get a seat on the main, on the main area. And, um, and everybody would come to watch, and he just sat there with chalk and would just sit there and, and just have the, the group completely enamored. He was a fabulous teacher. So truly tragic loss, but boy, does he leave a legacy of many people he has trained and many people he has taught and a major impact on the field. Uh, last week, we learned uh, that genetics pioneer Norton Zinder died on February 3rd. He was 83 years old. Uh, Dr. Zinder was involved in some of the earliest planning for the Human Genome Project and, in fact, served as a member of this advisory council uh, when we were then known as the National Center for Human Genome Research. Among his many scientific accomplishments was the discovery of transduction in bacteria. Uh, he was the John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Professor Emeritus at the Rockefeller University, where he spent his entire research career. Moving on to awards. David Allshuler of the Broad Institute and Harvard University, and certainly well known to everyone in this room, was given the 2011 Kurt Stern Award by the American Society of Human Genetics. David was honored for his outstanding contributions as a leader in the study of human genetic variation and its application to common complex diseases using tools and knowledge gained from the Human Genome Project. And the Kurt Stern Award is given annually by the American Society of Human Genetics in recognition of major scientific achievement in human genetics that has occurred in the last 10 years. Andy Feinberg of John Hopkins Johns Hopkins University, an NHGRI grantee, was given an NIH Director's Pioneer Award. This award was based on a proposal he submitted entitled A General Stochastic Epigenetic Model for Evolution, Development, and Disease. Congratulations to Andy. Kyolu Fox was a participant in the NHGRI Diversity Action Plan program. He also spent a couple of years in the NHGRI Intramural Research Program, and he is now, an F30, is now on an F31 fellowship at the University of Washington, and he was recently awarded the Best Graduate Student Presenter for Genetics at the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science National Conference. So congratulations to him. Manolis Kellis, an associate professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT, was awarded the 2011 Niki Award by the Athens Information Technology Center of Excellence for Research and Education. The award, which is presented annually, honors prominent Greeks or individuals of Greek descent who are internationally recognized for their contributions to science and technology and who inspire a generation of scientists. Another individual well known to NHGRI, Harold Shapiro, will receive the Public Welfare Medal, the National Academy of Science's most prestigious award. The medal is presented annually to honor someone demonstrating extraordinary use of science for the public good. Throughout his career, Harold has helped shape uh, science and public policy. And the Public Welfare Medal will be presented to Harold on April 30th during the Academy's 149th annual meeting. And to put it in perspective, previous recipients of the medal include Neil Lane, Maxine Singer, C. Everett Koop, and Carl Sagan. Shown here are the newly elected leaders of the American Society of Human Genetics. All are good friends, colleagues, and grantees or advisors of NHGRI, includes Jeff Murray as president-elect, Jeff Duick as treasurer, and then Vivian Chung, Evan Eichler, and Richard Gibbs on the board of directors. And then, similarly, a number of individuals with ties to NHGRI were recently elected to the Institute of Medicine. Uh, Marty Blazer, Vivian Chung again, Claire Fraser Liggett, Richard Gibbs, and David Relman. Congratulations to all of them. And at the same hold, the same holds true for recently elected fellows of AAAS, Andy Feinberg, Ed Marcotte, uh, Dick McCombie, and Rick, Rick 
Myers, right, sitting right here on council. So congratulations to all of you. Moving on into sort of the policy arena, last fall, Congress passed the Leahy Smith America Invents Act, reforming US patent law to align it with the systems used by other countries. Of interest, buried within this act is a requirement for the US Patent and Trademark Office to conduct a study on genetic testing. Specifically, the law requires that the PTO prepare a report for Congress on, quote, effective ways to provide independent confirming genetic diagnostic test activity where gene patents and exclusive licensing for primary genetic diagnostic tests exist, end of quote. The study is designed to examine the concern that gene patents and exclusive licenses can prevent patient access to genetic testing. The report is due to Congress by June 16th this year, and the PTO is holding public meetings in February and in March. The public is further invited to submit written comments to the agency by March 26th. And I will plan to report back on their findings at a future council meeting. On February 2nd of this year, the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues met in San Francisco to discuss bioethical issues associated with whole genome sequencing. The commission heard from a number of experts, including former NHGRI council members Richard Gibbs and Pilar Osario. The commission's focus was mainly on issues of privacy, although the discussions frequently returned to the issue of consent and how to make it meaningfully informed in light of very low genomic literacy among clinicians and the general public. The commission will be publishing a report on the subject later this year, and NHGRI staff are in close contact with the commission staff both to serve as a resource for any information they might need, but also to provide input on possible directions the commission might pursue. This past July, the Institute of Medicine Roundtable on Translating Genomic-Based Research for Health hosted a workshop to highlight and identify the challenges and opportunities in integrating large-scale genomic information into clinical practice. The main objective of the workshop was to start a discussion on what needs to be done to prepare the necessary infrastructure and to address the cha various challenges for realizing genomic medicine. Uh, the workshop summary is shown here and is available as document 22. We have heard that this report has generated the most interest of any of the meetings and reports generated to date by the roundtable. There will be a follow-up meeting in July of this year exploring aspects of the economics of clinical and research applications of whole genome sequencing that NHGRI's Greg Firo um, will be cheering. Motivated by the explosion of molecular data on humans, particularly data associated with individual patients, and the sense that there are large as yet untapped opportunities to use these data to improve health outcomes, the National Academies issued this report on Towards Precision Medicine, Building a Knowledge Network for Biomedical Research in a New Taxonomy of Disease. And the report ex explores the feasibility of developing such a taxonomy and developing a potential framework for creating one. So this report notes that moving towards individualized medicine requires all researchers and healthcare providers have access to very large sets of health-related and disease-related data linked to individual patients. These data are also critical for developing the information commons, the knowledge network of disease, and ultimately the new taxonomy. Another report, as you may recall, in May of last year, the Battelle Technology Partnership Practice published an economic analysis that was supported by Life Technologies, but related to the economic and functional impacts of the federal investment in genomics R&D through the Human Genome Project and beyond. Well, recently, uh, the Battelle uh, Group released a related report on behalf of the American Clinical Laboratory Association that examines the economic and functional impacts of genetic and genomic clinical laboratory testing. And the study found that even though it's in an early stage, the genetics and genomics clinical testing sector has been responsible for directly and indirectly employing 116,000 workers, generating nearly $6 billion in personal income, and providing $1.2 billion annually in federal tax revenue. Our good friends at the American College of Medical Genetics recently decided to change their name of their organization to the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. Uh, this will take place in March at their annual meeting However, they will still maintain their same acronym, ACMG. And according to ACMG, the name change recognizes the increasingly central role of medical genomics and its important along, importance alongside genetics in fulfilling the mission of the American College of Medical Genetics. NHGRI uh, continues to feature on our website a monthly feature highlighting a genomic advance of the month. 
Uh, recent topics have included a genomics approach to the study of trauma, the sequence of the full genome of, a bac of a, the bacteria responsible for the Black Death, next generation sequencing targeted at known tumor suppressor genes, and the use of previously collected GWAS data to uncover new genetic pathways that regulate how our bodies make platelets. I will now move to my regular genomics in the news features, um, starting with the recently sequenced genomes that captured news attention. For example, the genome of an aboriginal man who lived in the 1920s was sequenced. An analysis of the resulting sequence data suggests that his ancestors started their migratory journey more than 60,000 years ago, branching off from humans who left Africa. Scientists recently sequenced the genome of a Dutch woman who lived to age 115. Uh, she was born in 1890 and uh, passed away in 2004. This woman overcame breast cancer at the age of 100 and never showed signs of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. In January, uh, the scientist ran a feature story about Elaine Martis entitled High Tech Choir Master. Congratulations, Elaine. Also in January, the New York Times ran a feature article about Eric Lander entitled Power in Numbers. Uh, that article was accompanied by various pictures of Eric, including this one of him winning first place in the 1974 Science Talent Search. In the same year, he made the American team in the Mathematics Olympiad. And here is another picture from that same story that more accurately captures his modern look and energy-filled gestures. <laughs> And you just, you just don't want your neck to be between those fingers. <laughs> Another New York Times article highlighted the genomic data explosion and had an interesting picture of Dick McCombe and a sequencing flow cell. It's actually a good photo. It's rather interesting. ENCODE was identified by Nature magazine as a potential, quote, key finding an event that may emerge in 2012. An accompanying article foreshadows a major update from the project that is expected to be reported in a major publication in 2012. I do find it funny that Nature News reports the future by knowing about a paper that might be under review in the same journal. They really went on a limb on that one, didn't they? Looking at my ENCODE colleagues here. So, but still, they gave good call out about what's going to happen in 2012, well deserved. The NHGRI sequencing technology development program was featured in a flurry of stories reported in the Wall Street Journal, Reuters, National Public Radio, Nature, and other news outlets. Uh, these reports feature the announcement early last month that two major sequencing technology companies will release new systems in 2012 that are predicted to enable sequencing a whole human genome by $1,000. I'm sure this will play nicely into Jeff Schloss's talk uh, later today. But then we also have strange stories. We always do. Some of you may have followed this story that occurred uh, last year where there was an episode protest that was broken up with pepper spray by the UC Davis police uh, that caused all sorts of problems. And in the aftermath of it, it was a new story where the UC president talked about how free speech is part of the DNA of this university, which I thought was interesting. The other thing I thought was particularly interesting that DNA, uh, that universities have DNA and that I'm not, I'm telling the truth here. That very week, I went, like the day after the story came out, I went and got new tires put on my car. And as I was sitting there in the waiting room, there was a, 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 a sign up. This was a sign, I took a picture of my Blackberry. <laughs> What's in your car's DNA? Our exclusive DNA, you know, diagnostic needs assessment. These are a double helix coming out. So what we now know is that universities have DNA and cars have DNA, and with such developments, it's clear that our institute's portfolio of DNA research will only increase in the future. Okay, those are my news stories. Let me move on to uh, the extramural program. Well, following the extensive discussion with council about the renewal of our genome sequencing program at the September meeting, we made final decisions and announced the new awards in December. Recall that there are four major components of the renewed NHGRI genome sequencing program. Um, the first component is the large-scale uh, genome sequencing centers, which was renewed for four years at a year one funding level of $86 million. And as you all know, the funded centers are at Baylor College of Medicine, the Broad Institute in Washington University, with the PIs and year one funding levels shown on this slide. The large-scale genome sequencing centers will conduct research into how the human genome works, as well as studies of the genetic contributions to complex illnesses and ongoing special projects, such as the Cancer Genome Atlas. 
The centers will also be involved in new medical initiatives and will continue to implement technological advances in DNA sequencing, develop new technologies and software to analyze and understand the massive amounts of DNA sequence data now being produced and continue to train genomic researchers. The second component of our renewed genome sequencing program involves the creation of new Mendelian centers, Mendelian disorders genome centers. For this, NHGRI partnered with the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute to invest $48 million over the next four years to fund three centers, with NHGRI and NHLBI contributing $40 million and $8 million, respectively. The funded centers are located at the University of Washington, which will also serve as the coordination center for the group, at Yale University, and then a partnership between Baylor College of Medicine and the Johns Hopkins University. The PIs and funding levels are shown here. The, these three centers will collaborate with a worldwide network of rare disease experts to sequence the genomes of thousands of patients and their family members to identif identify the genetic variants responsible for rare genetic disorders. As the coordination center, the University of Washington group will coordinate the center activities that are essential for the program's success and will host the sole web portal for sample solicitation. The third component of our renewed genome sequencing program involves the creation of new clinical sequencing exploratory research projects. Now, for this, six awards of the indicated amounts have been made to the indicated PIs who will be investigating technical and ethical and so psychosocial questions related to the application of genome sequencing in the clinic. Note that the two awards with particular emphasis on cancer are being co-funded by the National Cancer Institute. The fourth and final component of our renewed genome sequencing program involves grants for developing informatics tools for high throughput sequ sequence data analysis. For this, six awards have been made for a total of $16 million over four years. The goal of this program is to democratize access to next generation DNA sequence analysis software so that independent researchers can analyze their own sequence data. This program builds on previous investments that have been led to the development of nascent software tools but the grantees will work to harden the software tools to make them reliable, robust, easy to install, and user-friendly for independent investigators and also for non-genomicists. The PIs and funding amounts are shown here, and also note that there'll be one or two SBIR awards eventually made as part of this program. One highlight worth featuring from the genome sequencing program since the last council meeting is the recent publication in Nature reporting the sequencing and comparative analysis of 29 Eutherian genomes. The authors generated a high resolution map of more than 3.5 million evolutionarily constrained elements that encompass about 4% of the human genome. This study further used evolutionary signatures and comparisons with experimental data sets to suggest candidate functions for about 60% of the constrained bases. Overlap with disease-associated variants indicates that these findings will be relevant for future studies of human biology, health, and disease. The data sets for the study are publicly available at the Broad Institute and at the UC Santa Cruz Genome Browser. The Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA, program held its first public scientific symposium in November. All presentations uh, described uh, research using TCGA data. The meeting was very well attended, actually it actually sold out uh, to, to total capacity. All the talks are available on NHGRI's Genome TV channel of YouTube, and the link to those talks is provided in document 29. Based on the success of this meeting, there will be a second TCGA scientific symposium in November of this year, and AACR has agreed to co-sponsor and advertise the meeting along with NCI and NHGRI. In terms of its science, uh, TCGA continues to make great strides towards its ambitious goals. The program had a goal of analyzing 5,000 tumor samples by the end of 2011, and they reached that goal. Another goal is to comprehensively analyze specimens from at least 20 tumor types, and the list on the right shows the active 22 projects in TCGA as of today. Accrual has actually closed for glioblastoma, ovarian, colorectal, and renal cell renal clear cell carcinoma, meaning the goal of qualifying 500 cases for these projects has already been achieved. There are active tumor working groups preparing papers for publication for many of the tumor types, including some of the most prevalent cancers. A manuscript describing the full characterization of the colorectal carcinoma genome is under review, and papers for breast, lung, and kidney cancer, as well as acute myeloid leukemia are in preparation and are expected to be published by the end of 2012. Moving on to the 1,000 Genomes Project, the phase one paper is being written on 1,094 samples for 14 populations with 40 million SNP, indel, and deletion variants on integrated haplotypes. 
The phase two data uh, contained low coverage and exome sequence data on 1,600 unrelated samples from 19 populations. And the phase three sample collection from seven more populations should be completed by April. All the sequencing should be completed by fall of this year on a total of 2,500 unrelated individuals plus 161 trios, and, or kids up tr within trios. And complete genomics uh, will deeply uh, stepped in and will deeply sequence 500 samples, including 161 trios. So in total, there are now 2,661 samples being studied by the Thousand Genomes Project. The eighth annual meeting of the Advanced DNA Sequencing Technologies Program grantees will be held in April in San Diego. As in past years, the last portion of the meeting will be open to other interested members of the research community. And as I mentioned earlier, Jeff Schloss will be giving an update about this program uh, later today. Moving on to ENCODE and MOD ENCODE, applications were received in response to three technology development RFAs, and these will be discussed during the closed session of this council meeting. Three ENCODE RFAs with U01, U41, and U54 mechanisms were released this past October, and applications were received in December. These RFAs aim to solicit applications for research projects to apply high-throughput, cost-efficient approaches to extend ENCODE resources towards as complete a catalogs as possible. Applications will be reviewed in March and then discussed by Council in May. And NHGRI is currently in the planning stages for a MOD ENCODE symposium, symposium to be held on the NIH campus on June 20th and 21st. Our goal is to broaden community understanding of model organisms and showcase the contributions of the MOD ENCODE consortium. The meeting is planned to tie into the upcoming Model Organisms to Human Disease meeting or that's being organized by the Genetic Society of America and scheduled at an adjacent time to our symposium here in the Washington, D.C. area. Moving on to the, some of the analyses being performed by ENCODE, um, at the December Geneva Steering Committee meeting, there was a joint session including ENCODE and Geneva investigators. ENCODE investigators analyzed eight Geneva Garnet GWAS data sets and they were paired up with Geneva Garnet investigators for hands-on demonstrations of how to use ENCODE data to follow up GWAS studies. Um, our uh, I'm sorry, new collaborations between the consortium were established already resulting in plans for publications and grant applications. Meanwhile, several integrated analysis papers are in the works. The ENCODE consortium has a major integrative, integrative paper under revision um, at a journal I mentioned earlier, um, along with many companion papers, um, all of which are going to be uh, aimed to be published in 2012. The Mod ENCODE Consortium is working on a paper that integrates worm, fly, and human Mod ENCODE and ENCODE data. And the Mouse ENCODE Consortium is currently planning a comparison of human and mouse ENCODE data. In our ELSI program, the new Return of Results Consortium is now active. This is a consortium of investigators conducting either behavioral, social, or normative research on ethical, legal, and social issues related to returning genomic results, including incidental findings, to study participants or to patients in the context of clinical care. The consortium includes investigators from seven R01 and R21 grants funded through the recent Return of Results RFAs, also includes ELSI investigators funded in the six U01 Clinical Sequence and Exploratory Research Project grants, as well as investigators on two other ELSI grants who are studying related issues. The consortium aims to identify areas of possible consensus that can, that can form the basis for policy development in this complex area. Already, plans are underway among the investigators for sharing outcome measures and instruments which should facilitate standardization and ultimately make it easier to compare data generated across studies. The Centers of Excellence in Genomic Science, SEGS, and Diversity Action Plan, DAP, programs held back-to-back -back meetings this past October at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. This was our largest SEGS meeting to date with 10 active groups. As usual, the science was outstanding. We're actually hoping to bring the two SEGS groups whose grants are now ending to a future council meeting so they can share their experiences and results with council members. The summary of the Diversity Action Plan meeting has been provided under Document 32. We will be discussing the most recent round of SEGS applications and their reviews during the closed sessions of this council meeting. And the next receipt dates for applications to the SEGS program is May 17th, and to the Diversity Action Plan program um, is May 25th. 
In December, NHGRI hosted a workshop on characterizing and displaying genetic variants for clinical action, dubbed the Clin Action Workshop. The workshop was a collaboration um, between NHGRI and the Wellcome Trust and drew about 80 participants from a wide range of disciplines and organizations, including several NIH institutes um, and centers, also the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, and the Food and Drug Administration. The goal of the workshop was to consider processes, uh, databases, and other resources needed to identify clinically relevant variants, decide whether they are actionable and what the action should be, and provide this information for clinical use. Uh, videos, presentations, and recommendations from the working group are now posted on our website, genome.gov, and a manuscript describing the topics covered in the workshop is under preparation. And a concept clearance for this area will be presented later today by Terry Manolio. Also in December, um, NHGRI hosted a Genomic Medicine 2 meeting, which built on the June Genomic Medicine 1 meeting that was presented at the last council meeting by Jeff Ginsburg and Taryn Manolio. This was the second of at least four planned genomic medicine meetings under the auspices of the new working group of this council, the Genomic Medicine Working Group. The meeting was attended by about 70 people. The goals of the meeting were to develop ideas for multi-center collaborative pilot projects in translational genomic medicine, to learn of new projects ongoing at potential partner sites, and to identify infrastructure needs and solutions to speed the adoption of genomic medicine. Six subgroups on topical areas were created and are now actively working and meeting en route to reporting uh, their findings and their recommendations at the next meeting. Uh, videos, presentations, and recommendations from the workshop are now posted on genome.gov and a concept clearance about this area will be presented later today by Terry Manolio. Now, a Genomic Medicine 3 meeting will be held in Chicago in May and will focus on barriers to implementing genomic medicine programs and discussions with payers, professional organizations, and government regulatory agencies. So that's what I want to say about the extramural program. Let me move on and talk about updates for relevant NIH common fund programs. Starting with the Molecular Libraries program. Now, the Molecular Libraries program holds back 25 percent of each center's annual award for release based on demonstrated progress at the mid-year point towards a set of year-end milestones. And the four NHGRI managed centers demonstrated good to excellent progress towards all milestones this year. The MLP steering committee meeting occurs twice a year, and the November meeting had individual presentations on center-driven research projects funded as part of each center's U54 grant. These center-driven projects were added, actually, at the request of previous NIH director, uh, Elias Serhuni, in 2008. Another key topic of this meeting was the development of a next-generation database to advance chemical biology data and analysis beyond the currently, the, that currently provided by PubChem. Development of this molecular library's biological database will be supported through grant supplements to several of the MLP centers. The COP program um, came to an end in September, but there are some no-cost extensions to cover wind-up or uh, wind-down activities. Uh, the COP finale and COP2 kickoff meeting was combined with an International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium meeting in September. For COP2, awards were made in fiscal year 2011, with overall funding for the program being $111 million over five years. The goal is to produce and phenotype 2,500 mouse strains. Three centers that had submitted paired mouse production and mouse phenotyping applications were funded, um, as shown here on the slide. One application was funded for the Data Coordination Center and database at the EBI. Um, the GTEx project, Genotype Tissue Expression Project, their investigators had their third in-person meeting in December. Um, at the point when the pilot phase of the project was roughly half complete. I will tell you that there's been excellent progress in meeting the milestones for the pilot phase, especially with respect to donor enrollment, as shown in the bar graph. Specifically, the program is averaging 10 donors per month, with the current total number approaching 100, and note that the pilot phase target is 160. Also, the resulting quality of the purified DRNA from the rapid autopsy tissues has been quite good, actually very good, um, essentially at the proposed target levels. The external scientific panel, who I actually met with during this uh, meeting, uh, was actually quite impressed and very supportive of this pilot phase of this common fund project. And so a proposal 
for scaling up the project to include an additional six to 800 donors is being developed and would be submitted to the Common Fund Group shortly for possible fiscal year 13 uh, funding. The Library of Integrated Network-Based Cellular Signals, or Signatures program held a consortium meeting in October with members of the production centers as well as newly awarded collaborative supplement, technology development, and computational tool awardees. The external advisory panel members for the project were also in attendance and provided several recommendations, including developing a trans-center project between the U54 and U01 groups, creating a public data release policy, and also defining metrics for the program. The Lynx centers have created a public website to inform the community about the Lynx program, as well as to describe the data available through their respective centers' websites, and also to discuss current experimental components of the program and to update users on uh, new developments in the Lynx program. NIH staff is in the process of developing a plan for bridge funding for Lynx in fiscal year 2013, and the proposal is being coordinated with the Common Fund and should be finalized shortly. As recommended by the external advisory panel, NIH staff is currently developing language for a data release policy for the program, which will include input from the Lynx, uh, the Lynx production centers. Next common fund project, Protein Capture Reagents Program. And for this program, the newly funded grantees of the Antibody Production and Technology Development Center, which comprises the Protein Capture Consortium, met for a kickoff meeting in December. Accomplishments of the meeting included formation of working groups to complete certain tasks and the development of a public portal to access uh, the affinity reagents. In addition, NIH staff put together an external scientific panel comprised of five members with appropriate expertise for the program. Uh, this panel has a chance to make initial suggestions during the December meeting, and NIH staff is planning a follow-up conversation in the coming months. Human Heredity and Health in Africa, or H3 Africa Common Fund pro Program. What I can tell you is that applications for all four RFAs, RFAs on developing centers, research projects, biorepositories, and bioinformatics network were all received in December, and we were extremely pleased with the response. In fact, we would rate it as excellent um, in terms of the number of, and, and depth and breadth of applications. The initial review of these applications will be in March, while the second level review will be at this council meeting in May. The biorepository RFA was reissued for some technical reasons and the due date is in February. Now remember that H3Africa is a joint venture between the NIH Common Fund and the Wellcome Trust, and the Wellcome Trust application process is proceeding well and is on a similar uh, timeline. And finally, an important meeting was held in November in Nigeria called Ethics and Genomics Research in Africa or Eager Africa. At this meeting, a group of bioethicists, researchers, policymakers, and representatives from various African countries and the United States and the UK gathered to discuss the ethical conduct of genomics research in Africa. These deliberations will inform some of the broader plans for H3 Africa. For the Common Fund's new single cell analysis initiatives, new RFAs were published since our last council meeting. They were in the following areas, studies to evaluate cellular heterogeneity using transcriptional profiling of single cells, exceptionally innovative tools and technologies for single cell analysis, and accelerating the integration and translation of technologies to characterize biological processes at the single cell level. Applications uh, were due in late January. And finally, among the new areas chosen for a potential future Common Fund initiatives is disruptive proteomics technologies. This potential initiative was proposed during the solicitation for potential new common fund programs last summer for funding in fiscal year 2013. The institute and center directors endorsed this idea, so the common fund is moving forward in developing this program. NIGMS and NHGRI have been asked to co-lead this effort. A trans-NIH working group has been established, including Tina Gatlin and Adam Felsenfeld from NHGRI and a strategic planning process is underway, which includes a portfolio analysis and gathering community input. A proposal for the program by the working group is due in late April, and if approved for further consideration, then a concept clearance will be brought to the Common Fund's Council of Councils at their June meeting. Meanwhile, early planning for new Common Fund programs that will begin in fiscal 2014 have just started, and now we'll have more to say about these efforts at a later council meeting. So that covers the common fund, and let me move on now to talk about 
updates from the NHGRI Office of the Director. The first is that the NHGRI uh, GWAS catalog um, uh, continues to, to, to curate GWAS data um, from the published literature by personnel within our Office of Population Genomics. Uh, that curation effort now accounts for 1,615 associations for roughly 250 traits at p-values less than 5 times 10 to the minus 8. As of January of this year, the catalog had reached over 5,600 associated SNPs, SNPs with p-values less than 10 to the minus 5th. Recently, two new columns of information were added to the GWAS catalog, Mapped Gene and SNP Context. If you click on one of the links under the Map Gene column, for example, you are taken to a relevant Entree Gene page. These fields are a result of continued collaborations with NCBI to improve the quality of data that are made available to the scientific community. And a collaboration with EBI has also been recently initiated to add curation expertise to the catalog team and to make informatics improvements, such as automating the catalog diagram and standardizing trait names to the ontology. Thirteen articles have now been published as part of the New England Journal of Medicine Genomic Medicine Series, edited by Greg Firo and Alan Guttmacher. There are a total of 14 articles planned for this series, total. And shown here are the latest four articles published since the last council meeting. The second annual, or the second USA, Science and Engineering Festival will take place on April 28th and 29th of this year at the Washington Convention Center. As with the last festival held in October of 2010, NHGRI will be heavily represented as NIH representatives with booths for hands-on activities. And as a result, you can expect that many, many, many strawberries will be sacrificed in pursuit of their DNA. Uh, this year, we will be partnering with the American Society of Human Genetics to have joint activities as part of this festival. Greg Firo chairs a trans-NIH working group charged with exploring trans-NIH collaborations on family history research and my family health portrait related activities. Meanwhile, Jeff Ginsburg and Lori Orlando co-chair an NHGRI organized working group on family history as part of our broader extramural genomic medicine planning efforts. NHGRI is collaborating with Suburban Hospital here in Bethesda and the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine to hold a monthly Grand Round style seminar covering topics in genomics medicine. Genomic medicine. Greg Firo is leading the planning committee for this series, which will run from last December to this coming June. All the talks are being videotaped and will be made available on NHGRI's Genome TV channel of YouTube. A meeting to explore the genomic opportunities for studying sickle cell disease was held last December in California. While NHGRI was the lead organizer, we partnered with several other NIH institutes, including NHLBI, NICHD, and IDDK. NIMHD, NINDS, I'm sure everybody knows exactly which institutes those were, heart, lung, and blood, child health, diabetes, digestive kidney diseases, minority health, and neurological diseases. How's that for the meeting? Um, this meeting was co-chaired by Michael Devon, Richard Gibbs, and Julie McConney from Tanzania. Attendees included council members uh, Rick Wilson. There was general enthusiasm from the participants for accelerating research into sickle cell disease using genomic approaches. The discussion also emphasized the fact that attention needs to be paid to the appropriate selection of samples and to phenotyping. And the participating NIH institutes are continuing discussions to explore future contributions in this area. Late last year, the Genomic Healthcare Branch, in collaboration with Grace Quo, held a meeting on pharmacist education in the era of genomic medicine that included representatives of major U.S. pharmacy organizations. And Howard, I think you were, you were at this meeting. Council member Howard, there's a picture somewhere. Oh, yeah, in the back, back row, there he is. The meeting discussed pharmacist education and genomics and identified a number of priorities to pursue. And a meeting summary will be forthcoming in the near future. And finally, and truly am winding down here, last, uh, the NIH, uh, NHGRI's intramural program um, let me just remind you, I mentioned at the last council meeting that NHGRI Intramural Research Program is undergoing a blue ribbon panel review. Uh, the last one was held in 2001, and in fact, they're supposed to happen once a decade, so we're right on target having one now. And shown here is the panel's membership. Note that Rick Myers is the representative from council on this blue ribbon panel. And the first meeting of the blue ribbon panel occurred last month and um, was extremely helpful and informative. I think it was a good kickoff to this process. The future steps for this review, all of which is going to be taking place within about a nine-month interval, 
will be a conference call coming up later this spring, and then a final in-person meeting that we're trying to schedule in July. So where we're heading for this relevant to this council is I've delayed an update about our intramural program, which normally would take place about this time, but decided to delay it. And in fact, we'll even delay it past May. We'll wait until September. And then at the September council meeting, we will have a presentation about NHGRI's intramural research program by the new scientific director. By then, he won't be so new anymore. In fact, he's not that new even now, Dan Kastner, who's our scientific director. But I haven't had a present to council yet. And I think we should just wait until the fall. I'll have him present. And then Rick Myers will be presenting the, the report from the Blue Ribbon panel um, as a member of that panel to council. So we'll do both of those things in September. In terms of recent research highlights from NHGRI's intramural program, uh, would include the following. These are just a few of many highlights. Uh, Dan Kastner, our scientific director and colleagues, published a study in the New England Journal identifying a, the genetic mutation that causes cold temperatures to trigger, trigger allergic reactions, a condition known as cold urticaria. In addition to pointing the way towards a potential cure, this finding provided new insights about immune system function. Yardetta Samuels and an NIH-led team studying the genetics of melanoma reported a very nice uh, finding in Nature Genetics about a new gene that's been implicated in the pathogenesis of melanoma. And Les Biesecker and colleagues, at the NI and colleagues including at the NIH Intramural Sequencing Center, at the Children's National Medical Center, at Johns Hopkins University, published a nice paper in the American Journal of Human Genetics that reported the use of next generation genome sequencing to identify a gene mutated in a pediatric condition known as paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. And at last May's council meeting, I mentioned that Bill Gall, who's NHGRI's clinical director and founding director of the NIH Undiagnosed Diseases Program, was one of nine finalists across the entire federal workforce to receive uh, the Samuel J. Hyman Service to America Medal from the Partnership for Public Service. And I'm very proud to tell you that not only is he a finalist, he actually won the award in the category of Science and Environment. These awards are known as SAMI Awards and they pay tribute to members of the federal workforce highlighting those who have made significant contributions to our country. Honorees are chosen based on their commitment and innovation, as well as the impact of their work on addressing the needs of the nation. And so we're very proud of, of Bill Gall and his accomplishments, and congratulations to him. And finally, I should tell you that's the end of what I want to update you about, but everything I've just covered in 90 slides was trivial, as far as I'm concerned, because the highlight since the last council meeting occurred not here at NIH, but occurred on the baseball field. So I'm, I'm, I know Rick Wilson agrees with me. I, there may be some other card. I bet Howard's a Cardinal fan. This, this was the most historic thing that happened in the last four months. Um, so any case. Oh, I, don't, I thought the Knicks game. Yeah. No, no, nothing. This has to be. Number one historic event in the last four months. And in closing, I, uh, 91 slides. I don't put these all together all by myself whole host of people, everybody sitting in the back on the sides and so forth. Thank all of you. Uh, thanks particularly to Chris Wetterstrand, who is uh, the person coordinating all this and making it all happen. And also to Larry Thompson, Judy White, and the web team for getting all this posted and all the videotaping and everything that goes on. So I will stop there and happily take any questions. I must be getting good. I just wanted to get to the cardinal highlight. I was just really motivated. Questions? Do I, the one thing I didn't stop in the middle. Do any of um, any of the workshops or things that council members participated in? I don't know if Rick Wilson wants to say anything about the sickle cell meeting. If Jill, you want to say anything about the working group? Howard, you want to say anything about the pharmacy meeting? Um, Rick, you want to say anything about the blue ribbon panel? I didn't. You know, we don't have to because we're going to come to these things with time. But I just, if there was something that was particularly you wanted to share. Microphone. I would just want to encourage people to uh, respond to the call for information for the working group. Uh, and I can't really say any more than that. But I, I would also say that the TCGA meeting was phenomenal. It was, it was really a great, great meeting. Uh, we, we hear this from lots of people. It Thank was, you for sharing that. It though. was terrific. Yeah. And I, I really, I, I already said it, you echoed it. Let me. Let me echo it again. Please, people, respond to the call for information because we are in need of input. Yeah, we'll send it and, to you. Well, I, it's a link, but we can we can we can send you an email. And I and yes. I would also okay. say that it's important to say what you think are important things to be done and also important not to be done. 
you know, what, what is possible and should be done, what is likely impossible, and effort might be better spent somewhere else. There's, this is a challenging area, and um, both uh, the internal discussions and I think the external discussions have had a lot of challenges of just defining the scope of what's realistic, and so I think that's part of what's being requested. And it's so, and yet it's so vital for our field, for this institute, it's really vital for NIH, of course. So yes, I really do, we really would hope people would get engaged in this process to help, and I'm sure there's going to be things coming back to this council about it. So it's uh, no question. So it's worth getting involved early. Howard? So I had the uh, privilege of being at uh, three NHGRI meetings in, in five days in early December, um, which um, I, I can't feel bad because you had to be at all those and more. So, so uh, But um, whether it was the pharmacy group or the genome medicine centers group or whatever the Terry called the one in between. Um, Clint Action. Uh, the Clint Action group. Yeah. Um, all of them, what really struck me is that not only is there a lot of enthusiasm about moving to the, the right side of the NHGRI, um, uh, NHGRIogram, um, but there's a lot of people who didn't know what NHGRI stood for and were outside of that space who are now starting to realize that there's something to work on. So I think uh, what I took away was not only do we have to be more visible, but really there's a lot of need now, the disease specific groups, not so much at, at NIH, but out in the community. Uh, really need a lot of help, and so uh, it was great to see how much you guys are cranking up for that, including reaching out to people like pharmacists and uh, nurses and nurse practitioners, et cetera. Um, but there's going to be a lot more of that needed, and so I think we need to keep our eye on that. Okay. Uh, the, echoing the same thing for this Geneva ENCODE meeting, uh, it, it, um, okay. in ENCODE we've known that lots of people who might be able to use the data don't even know about ENCODE. So this. It was just the initial one, and I don't remember the number of groups, but there were a lot of people Oops. in the room. Sorry. I think, uh, I think they all felt, well, I certainly thought it was good to, to try to get these two together, and I've had um, uh, responses from some of the GWAS, you know, for the people who didn't know about ENCODE, getting back to me after that meeting because they're saying that we really need to be more. able to do this. So, I think that needs to be expanded dramatically. It was, it was really valuable, I thought. Well, we would also look to, you know, your advice when there are opportunities to connect different groups together. I mean, that was an example where it was, that came up, that can connect two of our consortium together. When there are other situations like that and we can facilitate it, we will. I don't know if uh, council member, everybody knows how this was done, but they, uh, they we, you, NHGRI paired uh, analysis folks with some of the, uh, from ENCO, with some of the uh, folks who had the GWAS problems, and they, they worked ahead of time before mm -hmm. they came to the workshop, and there were a number of things that certainly that came out of that. That was a really clever way to do it, I thought. Sorry. Other comments or questions? Yeah, okay, so we're scheduled for a break. I think everyone, I hope everyone received Mark's email about food. Uh, you know if you go one floor up, you can get coffee, something to snack on there. Please be back no later than 11, and we're going to be serious about this. I'm sorry, I can't, there's a glare on the clock. So, uh, 10 o'clock, so we have adequate time for the presentations.